On the 21st of August, 1708, Ezekiel Cheever, headmaster for 38 years of the free school in Boston, Massachusetts, died. He was 94. Cotton Mather, one of Cheever's former students, delivered the funeral sermon. His theme was the shortness of human life. In a particularly striking passage, he addressed himself to, in the language of numbers to the crop of young scholars Cheever left behind. Children, he instructed, go into the burying place. There you will see many a grave shorter than yourselves. Tis now upon computation found that more than half the children of men die before they come to be 17 years of age. And what needs any more be said, he concluded, for your awakening to learn the Holy Scriptures. Four years later, as an epidemic ravaged the neighboring colony of Connecticut, Mather offered some seasonable thoughts upon mortality to his flock. His text was Job chapter 24, verse 19. Drought and heat consume the snow waters, so doth the grave those that have sinned. His doctrine was the inexorable nature of death, and his argument again took him from the elegant similitude of his text to the cold, hard statistics of political arithmetic. The extent of mortality is universal. They that have made nice remarks on bills of mortality will tell you that one half of those that are born don't live 17 years, that but about 40 of 100 are found alive at 16, that but 10 of 100 at 46, but 6 at 56, but 3 at 66, but 1 at 76. Were there as many nations as we are now entertained with snowdrifts, or as many persons as we can see flakes of snow, death, death will quickly melt them all away. The empire of death, as Mather put it, is a universal monarchy. A third and for now final example comes from Mather's funeral sermon for Mrs. Uh, Mehetable Garish, who died in November 1715, aged 21. This text also came from the book of Job, chapter 7, verse 6, now likening the passage of life to the flying of the weaver's shuttle. Elaborating his argument, Mather cited the psalmist's dictum, Psalm 90, verse 10, that the days of our years are threescore years and ten. He enjoined his parishioners to form a computation for themselves of how few among them would reach that mark. More than half the children of men, he reminded them, fall so short of seventy that it is affirmed they die short of seventeen. Indeed, he averred, if the clerks of our trained companies would bring in their lists and compare them with those of just twenty years earlier, the lists would be very little other than so many bills of mortality. The source of Mather's demographic knowledge was, in fact, John Grant's 1662 Natural and Political Observations on the Bills of Mortality. By applying a tradesman's shop arithmetic to London's weekly mortality bills, Grant had, among much else, constructed a rudimentary table of life expectancy, according to which mortality rates remained roughly constant at every age from 6 to 76. The result, as Mather faithfully reported, was that of 100 live births, only about 64 would survive to 6 years of age, 40 to 16, and so on. But why should Grant's quantitative observations of demographic patterns in London have found their way into funeral sermons on the other side of the Atlantic, and how did their travel affect their significance? Imported knowledge of demographic patterns illuminated current events in the colonies and across the world. It also shed light on the entire history of salvation from the scriptural past to the millennial future. In a 1715 sermon, Mather insisted that the providence of God marvelously at work in every generation, preserving the world from generation to generation, calls for our observation. Drawing now on William Petty's estimates of the doubling periods governing global population growth, which Mather would have encountered in William Whiston's New Theory of the Earth, if not more directly, he noted that learned men have, by exquisite computations, rendered it probable that mankind grows double to what it was in less than 400 years. Not only did such steady growth support scriptural chronology, like the balanced proportion of the sexes, which Grant had seen as an argument for monogamy, it also bore witness to God's ongoing solicitude. At times, finally, demographic calculation functioned not just to coordinate sacred and secular history, but also to flesh out scripture, sometimes in surprising ways. Mather's example seems to cast the relationship between demographic quantification and government in an archaic light. This impression may be salutary, but it needs unpacking. Mather's combination of spiritual and intellectual authority and of ecclesiastical and political roles, and hence the range of circumstances in which he brought Grant's and others' observations to bear, reflected his particular colonial situation. It's difficult to imagine the average Anglican parish priest rattling off a list of death rates in the midst of a service. In this sense, Mather's example suggests some of the ways in which travel changed even seemingly fixed observations. The social and geographical circulation of even the merest scraps of demographic knowledge, such as Grant's tentative life table, could extend the power and condition the meaning of numbers in complex and quite radical ways. 
Yet there is perhaps another sense in which Mather's example concentrates and clarifies in one person relations that may also have been present, perhaps in different configurations elsewhere. Throughout much of the British world, though not as it happens in Massachusetts, churches remained the major gatherers and repositories of vital data well into the 19th century. Despite their privileged access, however, and their contribution to secular debates about population, the distinctive and distinctively public role of clergymen as interpreters of this data has been little explored. Yet the same parish registers that went into life tables were also documentary records of morally significant individual and communal decisions and events. Juxtaposing colonial anecdotes with metropolitan patterns, Mather apparently thought it his business as pastor to connect these two aspects of demographic experience, thereby to methodize and improve scattered observations for private and public application. William Petty, inventor of political arithmetic and author of several papers on the scientific potential of the Anglican parish clergy, would have agreed. It is perhaps in the light of this same pastoral duty, finally, that we should see Mather's later support of smallpox inoculation. As with census taking in relation to the sin of David, so with medical interventions in relation to God's providence, religion tends to be construed as a barrier to be overcome by empirical evidence or bypassed for reasons of state. Mather's correspondence with Jurin suggests a different picture. In how many of your towns, he wrote, have one in three or four died that have been taken with it, that is smallpox? In your capital city, how has it grown upon you till many more than a hundred a week die of it, and the dead by it make a seventh part of those that fill your bills of mortality? The scale of the plague was measured by the numbers of the dead. But similar numbers, at least for Mather, verified the providential legitimacy of inoculation. 10,000 more have lost their lives, he wrote, by medicines freely taken even in health than through inoculation, which had been tested on several, more than one or two, hundreds of persons of all kinds. Yet the physicians of Boston would rather see above 1,000 of their neighbors within a few months killed than use a method that would have saved them. To learn from numbers was to heed providence. To ignore them was to tempt God.